I wish I had not waited 14 years. Somebody said, if you want to lose something, lose money. You can get that back. Eight out of ten millionaires have been financially bankrupt. Walt Disney filed bankruptcy seven times and had two nervous breakdowns. But don't lose time. There were 14 years I sat on the sideline. 14 years I said, I don't have an investor in me like Tony Robbins. 14 years that said, I don't have an MBA or a PhD and, and I can't compete with these guys. I have the complexion of rejection. 14 years. I silence myself. Wow. And so I regret that because there are some people that maybe if they'd heard my voice, it would not have turned to drugs. If they'd heard my voice, their lives would have taken a different direction. And I can't get those 14 years back. That haunts me. And maybe, I think that drives me when I speak with such energy. I'm, I'm trying to make up for that time, mm. but I can't. A time of great uncertainty and a time of change that's taking place around the world and a time when people are feeling a great deal of anxiety and fear and reservations about the future at a time when people are going to work and don't know whether or not they will have a job when they get off and not necessarily because of their performance but because of what's happening in the economy at a time when there are challenges more so than ever before in personal relationships, we look at what's happening on the crime level and what's happening with our youth. That many times I'm sure that we've all taken time just to stop and reflect many times when we hear what's happening in the news or read the newspapers. Where's all of this leading to? What's going on here? And so I think that now more than ever, we must begin to look at what are the things that we can do that would put us on some firm footing in life, that will enable us to do some things and, and use some powers that we have that many of us go through life never ever discovering that we have those things going for us. And part of that, I believe, is knowing what it is your life worth. What is it that gives your life a sense of meaning and purpose? Because once you find that, it puts you in your power place. See, if you know what your life work is, I encourage you to start working on it. If you can't do it all at one time, do just a little bit of it. And if you don't know what it is that you showed up to do, if you don't know why you're here, I encourage you to find out what your purpose is here. What is the meaning of your life? What will be different? Have you ever asked yourself that question? I've done that. I, I remember coming from a friend of mine's funeral and I was reflecting on how much time I had left. And I went for a walk in a park thinking about this guy whose life was so promising. And I mean, he wasn't an old guy. He was quite young, in fact. And I thought about all of the things that he said he was going to do and he never got a chance to do those things. And I start thinking about my own life and how much time I had left to do the things that I would like to do. And at that time, I wasn't sure what my life purpose was, what my life's work was. I wasn't sure about it at that time. And I thought about it quite a lot. I had some idea, but I, I wasn't convinced that I don't think I felt worthy. I didn't believe that it could be me to do this kind of work that I'm doing right now. And I say to you that if you begin to take a conscious effort to find out what it is that you're supposed to do, I say that it can literally save your life. I said that it can literally save your life. I was telling a group of people of a study that was conducted. Dr. Larry Darcy, who wrote a book called Recovering the Soul, he said human beings are the only living species that has achieved the dubious distinction of dying or having a stroke or a heart attack on a certain day. If you ask most people, what would you say the primary cause of why people will have a heart attack or stroke? Many people will say, well, because they smoke cigarettes or because of high cholesterol or because of stress or because of obesity. And all of those things are contributing factors. But ladies and gentlemen, 
More heart attacks take place in this country on Monday morning between 8 and 9 a.m. That's when the majority of people who have their first heart attacks have them. 85% of the American public, according to recent studies, are going to jobs that they hate, working on jobs that do not challenge them. They get sick thinking about going. <laughs> Migraine headaches. After the Sunday afternoon football game, or 60 minutes, the anxiety began to build. And come Monday morning, they drop dead of a broken heart. Some of you ought to think about not going to work on Monday. <laughs> about that. People are literally dying to go to work. <laughs> because, see, when you go to a job and, and you already know how far you can go, you can already see that proverbial glass ceiling. It's like going to a movie when you've gone in in the middle of the movie and you've seen the end and, and you sit there to, for it to start all over again but something is missing. You know what the outcome is going to be. You can't get excited about going through that movie all over again. Am I correct? See, when you're going someplace and you already know how much you're going to make, you already know how far you can go, you're in a dead-end position. It erodes your self-esteem. It lowers your sense of yourself. It creates an inner turmoil. It creates an emptiness in you. So I say that your life is worth finding what it is that you're supposed to do. And I'm not saying quit your job. I'm saying find it and do just a little bit of it. When I wanted to become involved in speaking, I started just learning quotes. Listening to other people's tapes, going to seminars, going to workshops, asking other people to help me. Just start working at it just a little bit, but do find out what your work is and hold on to it and don't let your dream go. Don't let it go. See, and here's a, something else I want you to begin to look at. Why is it that most people don't pursue their dreams or don't do better than what they're doing if they're capable of doing it? I think that many of us don't go the next step because we don't know what to do yet. And I say that, that the reason that we don't even explore the possibility of what to do is because subconsciously we don't believe that it can happen for us and we don't believe that we deserve it. So here's what I'm suggesting. How much time do you spend working on you? How much time do you spend every day working on your dream? In the last 90 days, how many books have you read? In the last year, what new skill or knowledge have you acquired? What kind of investment have you made in you? So I'm saying that as you begin to look at where you want to go, if you want to make it today, and things are changing so fast you have to literally run to stand still. I'm saying that you've got to make some conscious effort to begin to work to develop you. Here's something else. Most people are not living their dreams because of fear, ladies and gentlemen. I was in Columbus, Ohio yesterday speaking for a particular Ohio department. Young lady named Karen who greeted me, who organized the event. Very talented, very skillful. And she was talking about she wanted to become involved in the consulting business. I said, well, aren't you doing it? I said, you have the abilities. I said, you're not here because they like you. You're here because you're doing the job. You're making things happen. And she came up with all kind of ideas, but finally she said, I guess I, I can't see myself doing it. I guess I'm afraid. Fear, limited vision, and lack of self-esteem is what keep most people doing things they don't want to do. I was flew from Columbus, Ohio to Denver, Colorado to a major communications company 
And the person that picked me up at the airport told me about the fact that the company was planning on having a major downsizing. And they offered some of the employees there an early retirement, and some of them will earn as much as $300,000. And they said, this is the last time that you can take this offer. If you don't do it, when we have the downsizing, you might be among those who will lose their jobs, and all you will get is your severance pay. And only 50% of the people who were eligible to take the $300,000 took it. The others were afraid to take a chance on themselves. The others couldn't see themselves beyond that company. They couldn't see life after that company. The same reason that people stay in relationships where they're abused or they're unhappy or it's unfulfilling. They can't see themselves beyond that relationship. They can't see themselves enjoying life without that person. They think that this is all that they can do. The same reason that people get stuck at a certain level in life. They can't see things being better for them. And they think that this is it and this is all they deserve. This is all they've ever seen. It's been passed on to them. And they think that this is it for them. Oh, no. I was looking what Dr. Blanton, Smiley Blanton, who is a colleague of Dr. Norman Vincent Peale, what he said about fear. He said, fear is the most subtle and destructive of all human diseases. Ladies and gentlemen, fear kills dreams. Fear kills hope. Fear put people in the hospital. Fear can age you. Fear, ladies and gentlemen, can hold you back from doing something that you know within yourself that you're capable of doing, but it will paralyze you. And it seemed like you're in a hypnotic spell. And I asked you a question, what is the benefit? What's the benefit of allowing fear to hold you back? What's the benefit of giving up on yourself, of not stepping out on life and taking life on? What is the benefit for you? What's the plus in that? It's one of the things I had to ask myself. So I didn't want to make any mistakes. I wanted everybody to like me. I wanted to be perfect the first time I did something. It's not going to happen. You're going to make some mistakes. You're going to hurt some folks' feelings. You're going to create some enemies whenever you decide that you want to begin to take life on. You've got to ask yourself, how long am I going to allow this to hold me back? I like what Zig Ziglar says. He said, fear is false evidence appearing real. That is an illusion that we create in our mind. It is a state of mind that can be changed. So let's look at how we can begin to take some steps to restructure that fear, to begin to expand our visions of ourselves, to begin to increase our self-esteem. Webster said that self-esteem means confidence and satisfaction in oneself. Look at your life right now. Whatever you've done up to this point in time, your life is working. Whatever you have produced, it came out of you as a result of the kind of person that you have become. It's a result of your choices. It's a result of your consciousness. Now you have to ask yourself, are you satisfied with what you have produced? Is this what you want? Would you like for things to be better than this? Do you believe that you deserve better than this? Or are you content? This is it. You don't have to do every, anything else. That you've already resigned yourself in life and said, well, I'm happy. I'm not starving like the people in Calcutta. Are you allowing yourself to get off the hook like that? Or do you believe somewhere in the back of your mind or in your heart that there's some other great work for you to do? There's something else that life has for you. And that's why you're here. How do we handle this fear factor? How do we increase our self-esteem? You have to begin to fortify yourself. How do we do that? I believe that you have to begin to consciously monitor your inner conversation and start talking to yourself. Start building yourself up. Sometimes the only good things you will hear about you are the things that you say to you. <laughs> Young lady that, that was in the audience this afternoon said to me, I told myself yesterday for the first time, I'm proud of me. And she said, I felt good about that. So I'm saying learn to be your own booster. Start building yourself up. Start encouraging yourself. 
Start saying, I can do this. I can make this happen. When I started thinking about becoming a speaker, I said, yes, I can do this. I can make this happen. When I start trying to convince myself I can be a businessman after flopping and failing and losing thousands of dollars and feeling stupid and dumb and having people take advantage of me because of what I didn't know, I had to talk to myself because people were saying to me that I was dumb. And somewhere in the back of my mind, I was saying, you're right, look at what I've done. I had to say, no, 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 Les. Hey, hey, come on, man, get yourself together. You can handle this. You just haven't figured it out yet. It's all right. This is your training period. This is the tuition you have to pay for what you don't know. You can do this. Other people have done it. It doesn't take an Einstein. Get you some people that can teach you some stuff that you don't know. Get you some people that have done it successfully and learn from them. Take some seminars, workshops, read some books on how to manage a business. Change the way you see yourself and begin to tend to the personal details. Understand that nobody's going to take care of your business better than you. And when I start changing that kind of mindset of beating myself up because of my mistakes, and start looking at the possibility of my doing better, of my making the adjustment that would enable me to do what I want to do successfully, things begin to change. And I say, stop beating up on yourself. You do do it. I know you do it. I've done it. It's a natural inclination for us to put ourselves down. See, we are born negative, I think, in a negative consciousness because we live in a negative world. See, you don't have to teach children to lie. They'll lie automatically. Did you wet in your pants? No, I did not. Well, what is that? I don't know. You don't have to encourage kids to misbehave. They will do it by themselves. You don't have to encourage them to do the wrong thing. They will do it automatically. You have to correct their behavior. So I'm saying that we have to work through the challenges of life in learning how to begin to work to fortify ourselves. Repeat after me, please. I can live my dream. I can find my purpose in life and live my purpose. I deserve more for myself. I deserve more from life. Shake somebody's hand on your right and left and say, you deserve more from life too. Here's some other things, ladies and gentlemen. Begin to guard your mind against negative programming, like turn off the television. Don't watch the news. Don't watch it. I think that, that, that more people have a sense of hopelessness and anxiety about life. If you look at the news, you cannot feel good looking at the news. You'll be scared to death. You're scared to go to sleep. I mean, it turns your power down. You've got to be conscious of that. Don't pick up the newspaper and read it. No, no. I, just try this. Just experiment with yourself. Now, if your job depends upon you knowing certain things, let somebody tell you just about those things. But stop filtering the stuff you allow to come in your mind. You know that song you used to say, don't let nobody bring you no bad news. I tell my staff, look here, don't tell me any bad news while I'm on the road. Let me handle it tomorrow. I don't like anybody to tell me any bad news at night before I go to sleep. I can't do anything about it anyhow. Why let me go to sleep with that on my consciousness? No. No, and my, my staff, they know that. So they let it wait till tomorrow. And I have a period of time. Tell me bad news between 10 o'clock and 12 noon. <laughs> After I prayed and meditated and read my books, I'm fortified. I'm ready to handle it. I deal with them and I'm out of there and I'm going on to something else. So you've got to guard the kinds of things that you put in your mind. See, if you don't program your mind, your mind will be programmed because human beings are goal-oriented. That's why we die of broken hearts early. That's why we're running through life to early graves. We're going through life, ladies and gentlemen. And I think that Henry David Thoreau said that most men live in quiet desperation. Most of us go through life running scared. Larry D'Angie, who I think is going to be one of the greatest motivational speakers around today, told me a story, a true story of a friend of his, that every day when he came home from school, when he would get to uh, a certain block in his neighborhood, there was a neighborhood dog that would chase him. And that dog would start after him barking. Boy, he would run, just running from that dog every day, every day. Finally, he just got tired of that dog chasing him every day. He said, this dog come around here today, I'm going to take a brick of something and bust him in the head. So he was walking home that day, minding his own business. Sure enough, 
Same area, there was that dog there. And the dog started barking, he started running, he saw a brick and he stopped and picked up the brick and turned around and the dog got close to him, he realized the dog didn't have any teeth. <laughs> he said he put the brick down and said, get on out my way. <laughs> and ladies and gentlemen, all our lives, many of us go through life running from things that ain't got no teeth to do us any harm. you've been afraid to do something and then after you did it you say whoa if i known it was this easy i would have done it before haven't you ever had that experience raise your hand absolutely so we created this in our minds false evidence appearing real we made it real in our minds that's why churchill said there's nothing to fear but fear itself that's the destructive monster so Turn off things that can contribute to your fear. Turn a deaf ear to people that all they can do is talk about how negative things are because they have bought into the consciousness of the world. Start attending workshops, seminars, listening to tapes on a daily basis to begin to recondition your mind, to retrain your thinking. Faith comes by what? Hearing and hearing and hearing, listen to things that can empower you, that can enable you to create a new reality for yourself and a new life for yourself. You might appear to be strange around most people. You know, most people think you're strange if you're happy today. People say, how you doing? I said, better than good. Whoa, what's wrong with him? Just go around smiling and watch people. Look at this, this a weird guy over here. Because most people don't smile. Watch him. Look at their faces in the morning. Here we go, another Monday morning. How you doing? Haven't had my coffee yet. Don't ask me. <laughs> See, these people have not found their purpose in life. That's why they're grumpy. That's why they're miserable. That's why they're so negative. They're hurting and they want to hurt other people. So start practicing using programs for your mind. Seminars, books, workshops. Keep a journal. Record your thoughts. What's happening with you? Every day when you get up, have a journal near you. I use a Jack Bowling journal so that I can write down my ideas. I keep it by my bed so I can write down my thoughts. See, ladies and gentlemen, we get three to four thoughts a year that if we would act on those thoughts, they could change our life. Don't say, well, I'll, I'll remember that. No, write that thought down. I got a thought today I wrote down. A friend of mine is in the hospital. His morale is low. They're talking about amputating his foot. He's got to feel very bad. So I said, you know, I'm going to, I'm not only am I going to see him, but I can't be there with him all the time. I said, I'm going to create a tape for him that, that he can listen to that will heighten his level of morale. We told him the other night, don't go to surgery. You are depressed. Your energy level is down. No, no, tell him not now. Don't do it now. In fact, most doctors who have any sense of awareness don't perform surgery on patients that are in a state of fear. They don't think they will make it. They wait till they're in a different state of mind. So I said, what about making tapes for people that are facing physical challenges? I said, that's a good idea. All right? See, there are ideas that can come to you out of things that appear to be negative. I have a friend out of Chicago, just met him. He was 23 years old. And this guy, he went financially bankrupt two years ago, ruined his credit. Guess what he decided to do? He found a blessing in it. He wanted to restore his credit. It was very challenging, very difficult. And he realized that a lot of other people during these particular times have ruined their credit. So now he started a credit repair business. Last year, he earned over $100,000 helping people to restore their credit. I met a young lady who attends this church, that she was at her father's funeral, and, and she was putting flowers on her father's grave, and she looked around and saw the other grave sites. They did not look well-groomed, and they were not attended to on a regular basis. She started a grave site maintenance business. Out of that tragedy, something positive has come out of it. And now she's earning more money doing that than on her present job. What idea are you sitting on? Write your ideas down. And then, once you get that idea, take the leap. Hello? 
take the leap. See, a lot of people get the ideas and just walk around with them. Have you ever had an idea and all of a sudden you looked around and somebody had that idea and gone with it? Think you're going to be going with my hospital idea. Forget that, buddy. We will be out there together, Jack. <laughs> take the leap. See, it's out here in the universe. If you don't take the plunge, I guarantee you, somebody else will. Take the plunge. Go into action. And ladies and gentlemen, you will be surprised at how things will come together. You'll be surprised. Now, you're going to have some difficult challenges. I can tell you that now. Be aware of that. Things are not going to work out exactly right. For a time, they will, sometimes. And that's when life is just playing a game with you. I want you to feel good and relax. And then after a while, say, okay, the honeymoon's over now. And then life will come over there and slap you side of the head. Say, what you doing out here? Well, this is my dream life. Is that right? Come over here a minute. <laughs> oh, you went to the seminar, huh? Come here. <laughs> I can tell you that. But ladies and gentlemen, go into action with your dream. And don't avoid where the fights are. Get in the midst of the fight. And get some hickeys on your head. Get knocked down so you can learn how to fight, so you can hold your position. See, most people don't get out in the arena of life because they don't want to fight. Most people don't get out there because they don't want to get knocked down. They don't want to be dropped to their knees. But see, you're going to be dropped whether you're on the field or whether or not you're sitting on the sidelines. You're going to be dropped. So at least get dropped for something. Don't get knocked down while you're sitting down. See, that's how most people are spectators in life. You don't want to be a spectator. You want to get out in the field where the action is. And you will be amazed. After the struggle, there will be a calm period and things will begin to click for you. Come out here with what you got. You don't have enough money? Don't worry about it. You got the dream. You got the idea. You don't have enough resources? Don't worry about it. You need some help? Don't worry about it. You get out here in the arena, someone will look at you and become inspired and say, hey, can I help you? But if you're sitting up on the bleachers, nobody's going to ask you anything. You've got to get into the flow of action. Frances Hart called me from Chicago. She had been sitting on an idea of a show that she wanted to produce for 10 years called Mind Body Connection. So someone saw me speaking in Chicago at a sorority convention and said, I saw a guy that perhaps can host this show for you who has energy and charisma. She called me. She was so fired up. I said, listen, on the day that you want to do that, I'm speaking in Chicago. I can do it for you. And I said, by the way, I met somebody two weeks ago in Baltimore who has an idea of the same type of show, and she's doing it on radio. Why don't you call her? And then she called me back. Who else would you suggest? I said, well, I know Deepak Chopra. He wrote the book called Quantum Healing and Bernie Siegel. Could you get his number? I'll tell you what, I have a friend named Jack Bolin at the Church of the Day. He knows how to get in touch with him. Call him and he will give you the number so you can get in touch with Bernie Siegel. That lady started calling all around. Did not have the resources, but she had this idea and dream. And she said the other night when she came before the audience that had gathered in the studio, she said, I feel like I've been pregnant for 10 years. And tonight you're going to witness a beautiful delivery. <laughs> and it was. She said, I couldn't believe, Les, how things began to happen, how it all began to come together. And how many of you ever started on some dream and you didn't have all your stuff together, but you just went out there with nothing but faith and things began to happen for you? Raise your hand if you know what I'm talking about. Ladies and gentlemen, those hands up there, it's proof. The proof is in the pudding. These people have demonstrated it. And if they can do it, you can do it.